Where's the jingle? <laughs> Where the hype at? My head to the point <laughs> yeah. that you annoy me. Annoy me. <laughs> annoy me, damn it. Well, we need right? a jingle to this, right? We have yeah. a song. Like We need a jingle to, to our Nas. That's what we need. I, 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 I hear you, remember. Dan. I'm listening to you. I'm writing it down right now. All right? I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get on it, man. More jingles. Welcome back to Not a Strong Start, a podcast by filmmakers who talk movies, television, and cancel, cancel, hold on. cancel jingles and <laughs> stop singing jingles. I'm your host, In and Out. Wait, wait, and in again. I am not your host here and gone, and stay gone <laughs> like a fart. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm your other guy here for a good time. Not a long one. That's when you need to take a pooper in the bathroom. So, so in, this week, yes. in this so week's Dan. episode. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Reason. So why you change the name, Dan? That wasn't your original name? <laughs> no, because I can't sit there and give out false advertisements, okay? If I go with, with Minuteman, which is originally what I was going to go with, that's just false advertisement. If anybody knows me, if anybody knows me, they know that's just, you know, wrong advertisement right there. But and in and out of Minuteman. get a solid Three pump chump. Three pump chump, baby. <laughs> Three pump chump, baby. That's how we do it around here on the Nas channel. As we know, that's our personal record in, here. Out, but... and again. <laughs> in, out, and in again. We so rinse in... and repeat. We, <laughs> we <laughs> rinse and repeat. In this week's episode, we're going to be talking about some of the best performances, where like very small performances, but they were so epic, so crucial, so much that we had to give a dedicated episode to this. But first, we're going to hit you with the current event. Boom. All right. So, as we always seem to get news on reboots and remakings and reimagining, and I just want to touch on one that was recently announced that I feel personally it's not going to be successful and that is scary movie is supposedly they're going to reboot that franchise and bring it back again now i know me personally we've we've talked about this plenty of time uh comedy acceptable comedy has kind of gone out the window with everyone having a fear of being canceled or boycotted uh you know or just an uproar happening so I don't know if that type of comedy is going to fly again. They might have to dumb it down heavily. But then is it scary movie? It's supposed to be absurd, kind of offending comedy for some people. What are you guys' thoughts? Let's start with you, Dan. I think this comedy, this whole like overly played satire, like they way overdid it with that. And even with that franchise, the first two movies were pretty good. That was it. They had like four or five just duds of sequels. Like, do we really need to get it? Um, Anna Ferris, I thought, was like the best part of that franchise in the first couple of movies. I thought she was great in it. She was like a nice surprise casting. I didn't know who she was before those movies. Are they going to bring her back? Probably not. Okay, so if they're going to reimagine this, and if they're going to go for the younger crowd, you know who they're going to target. They're going to target influencers. They're probably going to get people that are TikTokers, like... That's who they're going to go for. That's who the celebrities are now for this younger generation. You know, the people that didn't ride dinosaurs. That's who it is. So, no, we don't need to see it, Jose, to answer your question. No, I can go off on a huge reason why, but then that would suck up the rest of this episode and we wouldn't have enough time to talk about great performances. So, I'll leave it at that. George. Especially, we probably won't have the Waynes brothers included in this. That's what I was going to say. It's like, if they're not attached to it, it's not going to work. That's why all the sequels didn't work is because they didn't, they lost the magic. I remember when they were, promote part two three whatever crap it was like two of the producers from mm. part one but no wayne's brothers just two of the producers some guys that you know we're not even gonna put their names just mm. know that they helped produce something on this yeah. past movie that was great and then you find out there were associate producers I mean, all they did was <laughs> yeah, walk their dogs it's, it's like it's just that guy who just came in the last day it's like here's a few bucks i'm out make me some money <laughs> <laughs> from three, I got three people dollars. From three people who watched the first scary movie, here comes scary yeah. movie five. And then we're looking like, is that us? We all watched it. <laughs> Which it's too bad. Like that genre, it has its audience, you know, because all that is is going back to like airplane and naked gun. That's mm. it's that kind of comedy, you know. And that if they gave a naked guns getting remade with uh, Liam Neeson. I saw something about that happening. It is. You know? So it's like, there's an audience for it, for sure. I'm not that guy. So someone will like it, just not me. Like, I've, I've never really been a big fan of the, that stuff. 
I kind of like part one of Scary Movie, but I, I, I'm, I'm going to pass on this probably regardless. I agree on that. I enjoyed the first Scary Movie. The second one, you know, also to a degree. Yeah. But that exaggerated, like, type of comedy like that that's, like, really ridiculous, it tends to not be what I gravitate to. Especially, like, the second one. The first one was the better film of of the of the franchise, but the second one had a lot of memorable callbacks, right? Because it's the one with yeah. the guy with the little hand, it's right? My strong, my hand. strong hand, yeah. yeah. The top <laughs> one, or even the whole basketball. I mean, the <laughs> and you see them doing like the whole stupid thing, like in the haunted mansion. So the second one wasn't bad, you know what I mean? Like for it being like a parody movie and what it was, it wasn't bad. The Wayne's brothers were still great in it. You know, you still had uh, what was it, Re- Regina Hall. You know, yeah. was in it. She was really good. Because you know what it what is? is? It's sketches. That's what it is. Yeah. The Wayne's Brothers are great at sketches. They're like, all yeah. right, how can we do a bunch of sketches in this one movie? And yeah. that's, I think that's what made it kind of work. Not everyone has that mentality the way they do. Like, mm. they just got it on lock. That, that family is born comedy. You know, and it's just like, if you don't have it in you, it's not that easy to do. Mm. Granted, it's not like there's not a lot of source material to, to, to make fun of these days. There's lots of new scary movies to do. So there, there could be some good gold to mine. But if you don't got the right people behind it, like you need comedians, you need people who know comedy. You don't need people who make money. People who make money don't know, don't know how to be funny. Yeah, no. and, and things yeah. you need to include things that people are gonna attach to. Like like Dan said, the second one might not be an amazing movie, but you had memorable things that things that that people remembered. Like even a, a fun fact, I don't know if you remember. Uh, I think it was with Regina Hall, her fight with uh with like the ghost and all yeah. that. There was these two female wrestlers in WWE who actually recreated that fight yes, in their I match. Yes, saw that. Yeah. I saw that. Yeah. And the only people who saw a scary movie were like, "This looks very familiar," <laughs> and then they put it side by side. I'm always a fan of them doing comedy because, you know, as we've talked about a lot, they're not doing it enough. But it doesn't. It kind of feel like there's a change in the ties a little bit, right? Like you're starting to notice them trying to push a little more comedies and comedies is more on the production level. You know, they've had a little bit of success with some of these comedies. So I feel like the tide's turning a little bit. I just hope we get some good uh, comedic actors that are behind this. Hey everyone, let's take a moment to talk about where I've been getting these new Not A Strong Start t-shirts from. Head on over to itsnaz.threadless.com, the only place where you can get Not A Strong Start merch. Whether it's our newly designed mascot or just your favorite movie logo now with some Nas flair. You can rep your Nas love on tea, hoodie, mug, rug and so much more so get yours today just click on that link below and have yourself a strong start and not a strong have a not a strong start have a a start that's strong but not so strong you know let's get into our main topic then so we're going to talk about again some of the great performances that we've seen from actors and jose take us away you're going to be leaving this with a second yeah this is all about efficiency these are uh actors who took their performance and they didn't have an hour of screen time, an hour and a half of screen time. This isn't Castaway, where you just see Tom Hanks for an entire movie, and he's got all that time to get your attention and, and develop this, this character. These are people who were given a short time and had to make the most of it. So, again, all about efficiency. Let's get right into it. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys the actor in the movie. It's all well-known performances. And then... Give you guys some options, see if you can guess what their actual screen time was. So first here, let's start with Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight. How long was he on screen? Was he on screen for 22 minutes, 33 minutes, or 45 minutes? Anyone feel free to guess? I think 22. I know it was like a low number. I thought it probably even less than that. But I'd say 22, I think. I was going to go with 22 also, but I guess just to be different, I'll go with the uh, with answer B of 33, you said? Yeah. So I'll go with that just to be different. The correct response is 33. Oh. So he was only, his screen time was only about a quarter of the movie because the movie was, what, like about two hours, right? Like yeah. Like, yeah. Been more. He's got some length to it. Yeah. So about a quarter of the movie is all Heath Ledger was in. And this movie, one of the main things that is remembered for is Heath Ledger's performance. Uh, George, let's start with you on these. What were your thoughts on his performance and what he was able to do with such a short time frame? You know, when you said his name, I was thinking like, Heath Ledger, it's like, he's 50% of that movie. But then you said to mention the time, it's like, damn, I guess you think about it. He's not on screen that much. 
but he feels like he's he's the whole movie. <laughs> like yeah. it's kind of ridiculous. Like, you're waiting like, for him. I'm like, go, as you're talking, I'm going through it in my head. It's like, wait a second, there's this scene and that scene and this scene. It's like, why well, is he not in more of this thing? Like he's just he doesn't even say anything. Just think about that scene in the hospital, like when he's walking away as the the nurse and everything. He has the little detonator. He doesn't say a word, and just him waiting for it to explode and all his mannerisms. And knowing, like, now down the line, that was actually all improv and that really was a late explosion. And he just went with it. Like, that kind of just know how to lose yourself in a role. Not every actor has that capability. You know, some other actor may have just been like, all right, let's do this again, guys. You know, like, they made a broken character, but not him. He just, like, he's still using it. It's like, I'm still in it. Like, I'm not going to lose this, this feeling. What would the Joker do? Like, who knows what he's thinking? But that's what you you start thinking. It's like, wow, what would the Joker do in that moment? Okay. And I was like, that's what he brought to the table with that movie. It's like every inch of him just was in it 100%. What about your dad? I think it adds more to the mystique of the performance, right? Like, that's what I like. So had you had too much of him, then it would have been overly saturated. And I think the fact that we kept them to like about a quarter of the movie, because even when you kind of think about it outside of that first opening shot or that opening scene that we have of him, it takes a good minute before we bring him back. So when you I remember I, I rewatched the movie uh, maybe a couple months ago and I realized that when I was sitting there watching, it, I'm like, man, we're like 40, 45 minutes in the movie. And he finally made his return back to the movie like it took that long for him to come. But it's so memorable that you're kind of anticipating and waiting for him to come back that it's like a nice treat when he comes. And I just think his performance is amazing. I've talked about it a lot on our, you know, on our podcast where I think he gives one of my favorite uh, villain performances I've ever seen. He's so captivating in that role. And at the time of his casting, I didn't think he had the really the chops to do it. Like I knew he was pr a pretty good actor, but I didn't know he had that in him. Like Bravo. And I know he won his Oscar, you know, sadly after he passed, but I don't want that to get tainted. Like that's the reason why he won. I think he was very well deserving of, of that role. And the man deserved all of his flowers and all of his kudos, but man, he captivated and completely stole that movie. And in my opinion, even stole that franchise, like of those three, like that's the movie yeah. I talk about. That's the character I talk about. And he's, and he outdid Jack Nicholson's Joker, which was awesome. So I also say, I kind of like wonder now how long was Jack Nicholson's screen time? In the original Batman. That's a good point. Like, I kind of want to compare know. that now. Yeah. That's a that good is. point. Oh, Jose nice. comes in well. <laughs> <laughs> According to my calculations, like the man in the chair. <laughs> That's why he has the glasses on. Okay, there we go. That's why. That's See, I have it on for necessity. He has it on for professional. Yeah, <laughs> Jack Nicholson was 39 minutes, so six minutes more ah, than okay. Heath Ledger. But probably a higher percentage because that movie probably wasn't over two hours yeah. like the other one. Huh. Yeah, he was about I think like thirty two percent of that nice. movie. Nice. But he was in it long. He was in it more than yeah. Michael Keaton. I think yeah. Michael Keaton was was like thirty four minutes in that movie. Really? Wow. Yeah. Before I found all this information out, if you would have asked me, I it's kind of like George. I would have put it put it closer to maybe fifty percent of the the movie, closer to an hour. Uh, so it's crazy that it's it's that little a quarter of the movie. And I think what makes it seem more is the fact that the little bit that he was on, every scene that he was in, he was the main person in that. He was the one grabbing your attention. Even in the scenes with Batman in there, your attention is on Heath Ledger. And I think the fact that every time he was on screen for how little amount of time it was, your attention was fully on him, makes you remember his performance and makes it seem a lot more than what it actually was uh, time-wise. And I, I think that is one of the same things we'll, we'll probably run into with some of the other uh, characters within this list is how much attention can you grab in as little time as possible? How much are you going to make me like or dislike your character or that emotion in there? Like you have little time to make me not be indifferent towards your character. And he was able to do that from the first scene to the last scene that he was in. For the next one, we have Louise Fletcher. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. She was the nurse. How long do you guys think she was She was in there? You know what? I'm not going to give choices. That makes no. it too easy. Yeah. yeah. You guys just tell me how much, how much of that movie you think she was in. Uh, okay, George. so 
Oh, so oh. go ahead. <laughs> uh, okay, so this was Nurse Ratchet, right? Mm. Yes. Right. Okay. It's been a long time I've seen this movie. Fuck. Uh, yeah, you it's been a long time. Friend. You are due, my yeah, friend. That yeah. amazing. I'm going to go with an absurd number of like 10 minutes. Oh, really well. <laughs> All right. Then. <Dan? laughs> <laughs> I take longer to take a shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is one that I would swear was in the movie at least half the time. Like I, I would think, you know what I mean. But that's what I'm going that, opposite of my feelings. Yeah. The last, but the last I, guess, I was like, I gotta go. Ridiculous. Yeah. Like, but <laughs> then when you sit and you kind of think about it, maybe let, let, let me go back to the 22 minute. This ain't this ain't a competition. So you go with what you're feeling. Not let's like go 22 minutes. The game. Let's go 22 minutes. Feelings, no facts. All right, let's do this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there are no facts. Well, somehow Dan was on the nose wow. two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Which is was like 17% of the movie. That's it. Yeah. But yeah, here we go. And, and Dan, we'll start with uh with you on this one. What were your thoughts on that performance and what she was able to do with those 22 minutes? Yeah. So she is like the perfect embodiment of what's wrong and how like isolated and and everything that the Jack Nicholson character is going through. Like I th I love that movie. I think it's great. But without having a true um, antagonist for his character, the movie would have been a lot more bland and boring, and it would have been a little more cliche in a lot of areas. She brought such a realness and like a hatred. Like you hated her. Like you hated her. Like yeah. <laughs> that was one of the first times. Like you. B word as a kid. I'm like, you were such a like that's how it felt as like a kid. Like, uh, man, but like she was so good. And I think her acting is so well done in it. She gives such a phenomenal performance. You know, I, I know I use that word a lot, a lot on our podcast, but man, she really did a really good job with it. And Nurse Ratchet, even the name Ratchet is awesome. Like the way that she antagonizes him throughout the movie, and like you start to feel for him because he's not a good guy, he's not a good character. But yet, the way that Jack Nicholson is, he's so charming that you still want to see the bad guy win in a certain way. And he found a loophole that he thinks he can go without having to serve prison time and all that. But man, Nurse Ratchet, like, play, you know, she pays, she pays him back and she drives a lot of the scenes that we see. And even when you see him trying to act crazy and acting goofy, her energy level is so opposite of him in that scene, but it works so well. It's like perfect, the whole yin yang thing going on. Great. I was like, it's doing? funny you mentioned like uh you didn't almost didn't want to say the B word. Mm -hmm. If there's a few things I do remember is I remember watching this with my mom when I was young. So I was <laughs> I was a kid, single yeah. digits. And yeah. I remember actually saying it's like, yo, that lady's a bitch. <laughs> 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 my mom's like, Yeah, that's that's right. That's correct. Yeah. Like yeah. that's the right time to use that word. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like I I remember her just being like the epitome of evil almost. And it's like as a kid watching it, because that's like the last time I watched it. I was a kid when I watched this movie. I haven't seen it again since. Mm -hmm. So all I have is that that picture in my head of like, wow, that's evil. And she shouldn't be working there. How did she get that job? That, that's all I'm thinking watching this, <laughs> you know. Never mind what he did. It's like, how is she in that position? You know, and I think it also just helped encapsulate that time period really well. Of how things were like in mental institutes, like they weren't handled well. You know, like people were mistreated and they probably went crazier than they should have because of people like that. And I think her performance probably inspired the reason why we ended up getting a show on Netflix. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I think if she wasn't as good as she was in that role, I don't think we would have got a show. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. See, I don't, I don't know if, you know, the writers sitting down writing that if they even expected this character uh, will blow up as much as they they did, yeah. and and a lot has to do with, with her performance to to be able in twenty two minutes to get pretty much the majority of people that watch that movie to absolutely hate you with their all their guts like completely, like you know it probably took her five minutes to make her to make uh you dislike her. 15 minutes to make you hate her and then 22 minutes to uh make you want her gone like forever <laughs> like uh it was it, it is so good and we talked about here before you know I, I i like a good villain i like a good villain better than a good protagonist and when you have jack nicholson on the other end and you're able to elicit such a response that you kind of match 
Jack Nicholson. That's not going to be easy to do on screen. And she was able to do that in 22 minutes. And you see her torturing, mentally torturing these poor men that are at this mental hospital. Like it's it's the mental torture and the anguish that she's putting them through just makes you because like you start to feel bad for the for the inmates. You know, you, you see them and it's like, man, you start to feel bad because you know that they feel somewhat helpless and their mental illness and their disorders is stopping them from being able to fully process a lot of what's going on. And the fact that she just keeps turning that knife, it's like, man, stop, stop. <laughs> so Some of them had a very childlike personality yeah. too. Yeah. You know, so like when you, you pair that with her, especially Danny it's, DeVito. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a, sweet, a little teddy bear. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it makes you empathize and understand why he became the Joker. And it's like, okay, I get it. I get it. Why, why you lost it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go for the next one. Uh, this was this was for Dan. This was for Dan here. I think the I'm gonna xenomorph know. an alien. Oh, okay. okay, okay. All right. How much screen time? Don't think with your mind. Think with your heart. Damn. In in, in alien, that one I know is not in, in there alien. Long. Yeah, the first alien. It's in there for a short time. I'm I'm gonna say nine minutes. Okay, George. Uh, I'm gonna go with twelve. 12 minutes. Okay. All right. Four minutes. Oh, my God. God. That's <laughs> laughable. Oh, I thought nine was too low. I was like, Ooh. right? <laughs> four minutes. My coffee isn't even done in four minutes when I put yeah. it on the table. I was like, I pee longer than that. What the? Three days later. <sighs> Many months later. <laughs> I've heard you. You do pee longer than yeah. that. <laughs> now, if you think watching that movie, and even to this day, the the tension and the fear factor, uh, and the you know that that creepy atmosphere that's created uh, with this the xenomorph or, around, and knowing it's going to be around every corner, and everyone being terrified, and you think, and that's four minutes of the movie that you actually see it. And, you know, that's a, a big problem that uh, newer horror movies run into is they show too much sometimes. You have trailers now that show their monster more than the xenomorph was shown in that entire movie. And that goes to show sometimes less is more when you're trying to create tension and fear in there. Just like... They they were like scared, like where is it gonna be? Where is it gonna be? Us in the audience were like, where is it gonna be? Where is it gonna be? <laughs> and then when it showed up, the impact is higher because you went. I don't remember how long that movie. Let's say an hour and a half. The movie was some give or take around that time frame. You went almost an hour and a half without seeing this thing. So I I think that's what even though it's you know a creature with no verbal ability isn't talking isn't really like acting acting can still have an impact with a character in short time frame george what, what were your thoughts on this i always think of this one it's like you don't see that monster a good chunk of the first half of the movie you know a lot of it really is just atmosphere ridley scott really understood that with that's what you get from most of his movies in the early days atmosphere plays a huge part of it that's a almost a bigger character than the thing that we're talking about it doesn't surprise me that's such little time but it is like when think of a real monster in movies, you know, like it's hard to think of really big iconic monsters outside of Universal that are really grotesque monsters. The Xenomorph was like one of those first ones I always think of. And it's true, like everything you just said, it's like having that minimal screen time just really amped it up. So like in that last was that last moment when you think she's escaping and everything, and in that dark patch in the background. You just see the shine of its head kind of peeking out from that. It's like it's a rat in a freaking pinhole, you know, just coming out. And you're slowly seeing it. It's like it just builds up. It's like, holy shit, like she didn't escape. It's right there. It's right there. <laughs> you know? And if you needed that through that whole movie of never seeing it to have that moment of like, holy shit, it's real. It's happening right now. <laughs> Dan, what about you? Probably the best performance out of all these performances you're going to be mentioning <laughs> is the Zeno more from my unbiased point of view. No, but uh, that moment, even what you're talking about, George, it's like you don't fully see the big height 
of the monster of the creature until that very end where it's like, oh, my God. So the thing that I love about this is that they took a page out of Jaws where you don't show it and you start to build the good atmosphere. You start to build the hype of the monster of the creature. And then you start when you start to get like uh, little visions of it and you start to tease it. You as the as the audience is starting to build up the mystique of this creature and this monster. And the great thing about the Xenomorph is that it's such a w weird, unique looking design that no matter what we think it looks like, there's no way nobody nailed it. Like nobody nailed this thing. So when you see when it's all weird and deranged, that was the most freaky looking alien looking alien I've ever seen at that age. Cause I'm like, <laughs> well, that's an alien. Cause we usually take yeah. the big headed ones from like fire in the sky. You the know? gray like, man, oh, the gray that. man. Yeah. The gray but, man. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen that before. I've never seen a Xenomorph before. And it, absolutely looks like the perfect killing machine the way that they had designed it and the way that they originally created it so that's why prometheus pisses me off because he said we no we created in a lab it's like no you didn't because it was a perfect it was a perfect killing machine that existed out there in space please let me live with that oh. i think just to add to that just to, to show how great that design was i think back as uh, jose, uh, jose uh dan you've mentioned it many a times and it, it has to get mentioned again alien resurrection you know, maybe not one of the best of the franchise, mm. but when they put the alien in the water, it's like, yeah, that makes total sense. That th mm. that design, I could totally see that thing in the water, and you're screwed. That's like a shark. <laughs> like you just got this thing, this smooth torpedo just coming at you, and the just way the it swims too yeah. is like, yeah. And this was this was made in the seventies, and it's and yeah. to see it in new atmospheres like that and new the new areas, it made total sense. Like it works. Like it's like they knew in advance what they were doing with this creature i just rewatched that for the second time ever yesterday just second oh damn and what did you <laughs> because think the first time i watched it i was like this isn't one and two and then i just would always just do one two and then yeah skip it uh mm -hmm. skip all of them after that it's better than i remembered so that scene is fresh in my head yeah when when that last woman is in there and the xenomorph is coming and i was like don't even try my don't biggest try. fear <laughs> man. i'm not my... going anywhere that's my biggest fear is just drowning in water like that. And when you grab the ankle and you see her just getting pulled into the darkness, it's like, oh, that is <laughs> petrifying. <laughs> Let's stick with the sci-fi aspect of this. And we have Darth Vader, New Hope. What are the times mm. we think in here? Let's go uh, 23 minutes. George? Probably the last. That here. sounds like a, lo a long time, honestly. Yeah, it does. I, I, I want to go still single digits, I think, for him. I, I want to go like nine, nine, yeah, nine minutes. Uh, George is close. It's 12 minutes of mm. screen time for, for Darth Vader. This is probably one of the most iconic characters that even people who are not Star Wars fans know Darth Vader. And it all started with these 12 minutes. Uh, so, Dan, we'll start with you on this one. What were your thoughts on, on this performance? You know, as as the old quote goes, it only takes 12 minutes to fall in love with somebody. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I might have read that from a Porsche cookie. But the point is, Darth Vader is, like, perfectly captured, like, my youth when I was a child and, like, opened up my fascination for sci-fi and movies and imagination and playing and everything. And Darth Vader was such the perfect epitome of villain especially as a kid around that, because Darth Vader, even though he was like scary, he was never too scary for me as a kid. It didn't feel like a true, it didn't feel the way that that when I first watched Freddy Krueger felt, right? Like with Darth Vader, it didn't feel as, he felt menacing, but like menacing isn't that type of villain or, or scariness. So there was like a powerfulness to him. Yeah. And then when you're voiced by James Earl Jones, has like that rich royal voice that he has. Man, Darth Vader, like he created Star Wars. Like, yes, we had Luke. Yes, we had Han. Like, yes, we had lightsabers and Jedis, but it was Darth Vader. Like, that's what made Star Wars is the fact that you had the aesthetic design of Darth Vader that, that really captured everything. Like, that's one of the best aesthetically designed villains we've ever seen. And I think he's the reason why Star Wars blew up to what it was to the point where, and you know, uh, Hayden Christensen still keeps getting roles because he played yeah. Anakin when we were younger. Like it spawns so many careers and stuff based off of him. But man, Darth Vader! Like you can't have a list of top three villains of all time and not have Darth Vader on it, unless it's a stupid list. <laughs> yeah, Whoa. that's right, stupid list, stupid. 
yeah. <laughs> what about you, Jordan? To tack onto that, you mentioned like his his design. I feel like the way he looks, even ignoring James Earl Jones' voice, which is masterful. That look, that design, having that white backdrop of the Death Star, like everything in the Death Star is very bright, but he's this dark void. There's only a few bits of colors on him, and you have that helmet that just shines kind of like the Xenomorph's head. That silhouette, you know that silhouette, and then pair it with a red lightsaber, and it's like, it's so, like you said, it's menacing, like it stands out. I, I think of a void. I think of this emptiness that's just going to swallow you, you know, kind of like a black hole. That's what he was for me watching him as a kid. And it's that small screen time. Every time you saw that silhouette come in, it's like, oh, it's, it, that's it. Like, we're about to get swallowed up because this guy's here and he means business. It's one of the things I hated about uh, Return of the Jedi. As much as I love the original trilogy, that one moment when he has his mask off, it just took away the mystique of what part one gave us. Part one, having that just unknowing. Like, this is him. This is it. Not. If you took off the mask, there'd just be more darkness. That's what it was for me. You know, <laughs> it was eternal darkness inside of him. That's what he represented. And I, I, I feel like everything after that kind of like just peeled that away. And I didn't like that. Like, I like having the idea of like, this guy is just evil. He is just the dark side. He's, he's so much the dark side that he's all dark. Mm -hmm. Like even Palpatine has some white on his face. Not this guy. He is mm -hmm. the dark side. That's That's what it was for me as a kid watching this guy. And that's the thing with this performance is what it exudes. Like if you think back at, at the, this character in the poor, doesn't really do much, especially like physically, he doesn't really do much. But between the look, uh, the voice, the delivery, heavy breathing, like I said, the, the lightsaber, the small little threatening actions that he does do, you feel how much of a badass this character is. And how much of a of a threat they are without really seeing it on screen, you believe it uh, from what, everything you get from this character. And I think that's why with just twelve minutes of screen time, like decades ago when this movie was done, and this character is still I iconic from that. So, and and like you said, you can't make a list of uh, you know best villains, most iconic villains, whatever you want to call it. And not include Darth Vader. Yeah, which and all credit to like we talk about James Earl Jones and stuff, but like Proust, who was the guy inside, like his stature added a lot to it. Like his movements, like it's not James Earl Jones was like, could you please move like this? Like, no, he's not telling him what to do. <laughs> you know, this guy has to decide, like, I'm gonna move like this, I'm gonna put my hand out a certain way, you know, I'm gonna you know, bring this bravado with my physicality kind of like how doug jones does with every performance mm -hmm. he he does you know that's what this guy brought and like he doesn't get enough you know credit to that i think that's very important yeah have you seen the footage no. where you hear his voice it's not as good as james Earl jones it's not, <laughs> no that's, no, that's why not. lucas is like oh no we'll, we'll, we'll fix it in post yeah. <laughs> right. poor guy shows up to the premiere thinking that it was his voice I know. He didn't know it's like he's watching it. He's there with his mom watching the movie. It's like, ah, oh, man. That's funny. Lucas was there was like, oh, good voice. Not good luck. Ooh, good luck. Not good voice. Mm -hmm. Bring them together. Which is crazy because, like, James Earl Jones is not a small guy. It's not <laughs> oh, yeah. He's not a small guy. And at that time, like, he was leaner, too. So it's like, I don't mm. know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so sticking with uh, with villains... Here we go. We see this list. It's a lot of villains that don't have a lot of screen time. So sticking with that. <laughs> Anthony Hopkins, Silence of the Lambs. What do we got for time frames? Eight minutes. Okay. Eight minutes? George? I'm going to price this right you, but in the opposite way, seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were both too low. It was actually 12 minutes of screen time. 12, that's, a, good, that's a popular much. number, huh? 12 and 22. Yeah. 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 Start with uh, you on this one, George. What were your thoughts on Anthony Hopkins and what he was able to do with those twelve minutes? That dude is so sinister in this movie. <laughs> like everything I've watched him in afterwards, and even before, because I've seen him in other things when he was younger. But for some reason, in this movie, man, just that you know the thing and all that stuff, like just the the little stuff that he does with his face and and his vocals. I was like, damn, this guy is freaking. I don't even want to talk to him between glass or bars like it's kind of like i understand why jodie foster was afraid of him like she was mm -hmm. literally afraid like i get it 
It's like he seems like kind of nuts in his eyes. Like to to know with your eyes what to do, it it's always amazed me when it comes to acting. You know, like me yeah. and Jose, we come from like that world of stage and stuff. And mm -hmm. like with stage, you're not thinking about your eyes so much as much as your body. You know, it's like I have to do extra here, but to have that kind of control with this, I he I feel like he totally nailed it. Just with that alone, never mind just how his vocals and how he just talked about certain things to her and explained things and the way he was questioning her. Just all of it, just like who's in charge here? It's just not her, apparently. You're the prisoner, <laughs> but it's, it seems like yeah. you're the guy in control this whole time. So, like when you watch other movies and he escapes, it's like, yeah, of course you escaped. Like you probably sweet talked your way out of that prison, <laughs> didn't you? you <laughs> yeah. Ben, what about you? Yeah. So for me, uh, it's how menacing he was as we've talked about but he would fall under the category of top three for me of best villains the way that he really scared her in real life and jodie foster is like a phenomenal actress she was amazing you know she's award-winning but the fact that anthony hawkins was still able to, to terrify her to that level even on set the whole how he escapes is one of the most darkest scenes i think in cinematic history and it's movies like that that have pushed the envelope or at least set the bar, I should say, that made movies chased. So now we've seen, you know, how many doppelgangers have we seen of, or projects that have tried to duplicate how dark and evil and stuff that that, you know, uh, Hannibal Lecter has been. But this movie set the bar for that so that other ones a lot, oftentimes feel like they're being like a copycat. Right. Like it feels like, OK, you're trying to do what they did here. Yeah. This was so clearly a cat and mouse game. And even when you rewatch the movie, there's so many things that are said through dialogue. But there's far more many things that are done through physicality and the things that they share on screen and the off looks and the fear and all that that's, that's done on camera. So, man, Anthony Hopkins, man, Sir Anthony Hopkins. Yeah. <laughs> and and that, that's true. You make a you make a good point. You know, after that, you've got in so many movies, TV shows, things where you have, you know, the the serial killer who, you know, they need to go to to help them solve a crime and start slowly manipulating the person. It's it became a trope after uh, after that, the very popular one. But no one's delivered it like Anthony Hopkins. And what makes his performance so good is. You look at Anthony Hopkins, you pull him out of that movie. You look at Anthony Hopkins and you're like, no threat there. You're, you're not at all fearing when you look at <laughs> Anthony Hopkins. You put him in that role and there's there, there's a fear to it. There There's a like uncomfortableness to it of like, I, I can't turn my back to this guy. So you ignore what he physically looks like because of what he was able to present with this character. And you, you can tell some of those reactions from Jodie Foster is our natural reactions to what she is seeing in, in front of her. They, you know, she probably got some chills herself. And to think that character, again, like some of these other ones, remembered for decades after people still remember this character. And it was 12 minutes of screen time. 12 freaking minutes in there. That's not even that's not even a third of a sitcom. Joe, in there. He's and not that, even the main bad guy of the movie. He's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. To be honest, there's a lot of people that I've talked to. They don't remember who the main bad yeah. guy is from the movie. They remember <laughs> Jodie Foster and they remember Anthony Hopkins. That was it. And that's what he was able to do with it. I think another thing that made uh, the Hannibal Lecter character so brilliant, like the idea of him, is that he there was something so uh, like elegant Right. And even when I talk about like with his escape, you hear the operatic music and you hear like the poetry with him uh, mixed with the macabre. Like you see the the dark, the vile, the evil. And I think that movie perfectly captures what we see, because when we normally think of the other villain that's in the movie, that Buffalo Bill, like they're almost feral. They're almost like dumber than our hero. Dirty, but they're, they're very dirty. Yeah, too. they're very yeah. dirty, but they're savage. The thing about him that's so scary is that he's so he's smarter than you. He's way more intelligent than you. But usually when you get something like that, like maybe you'll get like a lion, let's say, right, that like, you know, perfectly pounces. But there's something very elegant about it. The thing that's so scary about him is that there's a feralness to him on top of him being so intelligent. So even the way that he 
consumes his prey. <laughs> I'm trying to make sure that we don't get flagged here. Yeah. <laughs> the way he consumes his prey and the way he eats his meals, let me say, there's a dirtiness to it, but it's done so eloquently that he's still that smart, intelligent being. But but when you deal with something that's so feral in a certain way, it's scary because they they lose the human. You know that they're not thinking with human emotions. So there's no way to, you know, uh, if you beg them, if you plead for them, it's going they're not listening. Right. Yeah, there's like no rationalizing. Feral. Yeah. yeah. As intelligent as he is, he gets that feralness in his eyes that when he sort of lo locks on like a shark to blood, that's what's so damn fascinating about his character that we just don't get. And later, you've seen so many villains and actors and whatnot that have tried to capture that. And when you see his feral side, it's now too late. Exactly. You. Yeah. Your exactly. scalp is already open. <laughs> it's already open, my friend. You're already getting a haircut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that's what this list is, is for. You know, I thought this would be a good topic to talk about because, you know, Sometimes you can do a lot more with less if you've got the right performer uh, in there. And it doesn't matter how a character is written. If the right actor is there and can make the most of it, then, you know, become the character and improv little moments like we you talked about with uh, Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight can create a presence, can steal a scene and focus attention on yourself. It doesn't matter if you're in the movie for an hour and 10 minutes or you're in the movie for eight minutes. You can still make an impact. So let's do uh, what's on the queue. So what's a movie that you recommend to our listeners, that one that maybe captured a really, really good performance and you think it's definitely worth, whether the movie itself was okay or not, leave that up to you, but the performance itself was so fantastic. George, do you want to go first? Sure. You know what? I'm not going to say one that we said today. I'm going to switch it up a bit. Mm -hmm. We mentioned a lot of bad guys out there. Let's, I'm mm -hmm. going to drop it to some of the good guys. I'm going to go with my boy Michael Pena. All right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go with a movie that's not necessarily a great movie, but any Ant-Man movie you want to choose, mm -hmm. one or two, it doesn't matter. That boy steals the show. I am in to watch those movies just to watch him give me the cliff notes to whatever it is that we're going to see. <laughs> yeah. Well said. Well said. All right. Jose. I'll throw in a a, a show uh, stealer also. I'll go with Tom Cruise, Tropic Thunder. Yes. Mm, this is yes. someone who was able to to do a lot and make himself memorable with very little. Good. Yeah, good one. I'm going to go with one that when I hear this topic, this is one that I automatically envision in my head when we talk about limited role because this actor had one scene in the entire movie and that movie is Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. And this is Alec Baldwin. This is a movie that had Al Pacino, Al Pacino in his prime. And you had Alec Baldwin that was in one scene, just one scene with a set of brass balls. And he's going off talking about the ABCs, always be closing. And the way he just berates and belittles all the men that are in that scene and you got some fantastic like legendary actors but man Alec Baldwin steals that scene so that alone is just worth watching the movie even though the movie's good that performance is amazing so there you go so let's put a pin in it so on that note thank you for watching another episode of Not A Strong Start please like subscribe comment share on the YouTube channel Not A Strong Start you can listen to us anywhere you listen to your podcast you can follow us on Instagram at Twitter Not A Strong Start I'm your host in and out and in again, you can follow me at King underscore Sangre. And I am not your host here and gone. And you can find me at This Is Me Nombre on Instagram. And I'm your other guy here for a good time, not a long one. You can follow me at Nicolopolis. Yeah.